Good morning, everybody. It's, a, it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce another uh, colleague uh, from the, with the Swiss affiliation. This time is Professor Siddhartha Mishra, uh, who's currently a professor of applied mathematics at ETH Zurich. Uh, Sid received his PhD degree in mathematics from the uh, Indian Institute of Science and the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Bangalore, India. And uh, Sid has a very broad uh, spectrum of research interest that they are starting in numerical analysis and scientific computing and nonlinear PDEs. And then they extend to areas like computational fluid and plasma dynamics, computational geosciences. And the last uh, time, the last year or more, he has been doing some exciting work in machine learning. So I find this fusion of classical numerical analysis and scientific computing and machine learning quite exciting. And, and I ask him to uh, give us a, a talk about his recent work. So his um, work on the design and analysis of efficient numerical methods um, for hyperbolic system of conservation laws has found implementation of state-of-the-art high-performance computing platforms. And he has done a lot of applications and he has received several honors and awards. Um, so in Europe, one of the biggest award that comes with substantial funding is the European Research Council Award. So Sid doesn't have one, but he has two. He has the starting grant as a young person in 2012. And then he received five years later, the ERC Consolidator Grant in 2017. He has received the Richard von Mises Prize in 2015. And I think von Mises had an affiliation with Harvard at some point, the Applied Math Program of Harvard. Uh, and he also has received the Jacques Louis Lyon Medal in 2018, the College Prize in 2019, and the Infosys Prize in 2019. And he has been also an invited speaker at the International Congress of Mathematicians in 2018. Um, it's a great pleasure to have you here, Sid, and we are looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Sid, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Petros. And uh, first of all, for this very kind introduction and also for the invitation, I'm very excited and honored to talk at your institute, uh, this institute. And I'm going to talk today about uh, the interface between machine learning and uh, PDE computations. But uh, before that, let me try to explain a little bit. Uh, first, let this start working, yeah. Let me try to explain a little bit where I come from and why I'm even interested in the use of machine learning in this context. So as Petros uh, said uh, so eloquently, I, my principal scientific focus is on uh, large and important class of nonlinear PDEs, hyperbolic systems of conservation laws and on the efficient simulation. And in this context, uh, in my group, we have simulated things like core collapse of supernovas, of uh, waves in the solar atmosphere, clouds in the Earth's atmosphere, tsunamis in the ocean, and uh, things like that, many, many other things. And in this context, let me show you a simulation that I am sort of proud of. And uh, maybe Petros will relate to that. Okay, so here is the simulation. Let me just show you the video and then I'll explain it. What you're looking at is the evolution of the gas density of a compressible gas. Uh, and the density evolves, you see all these turbulent uh, structures. There's just a the gas density as a function of time. And you see this very, very complex evolution. Okay, and this simulation just goes on. But, uh, and the reason why I'm proud of this simulation is to make this simulation, you need a lot of different inputs. So what we're simulating are the Euler equations which describe aerodynamics. And uh, to do so, we needed a third order entropy stable scheme, something with, that we developed in-house. And this is a very, very big simulation. It's a 2048 cube simulation. And this of course uh, resulted in something like 43 billion degrees of freedom per time step. And Petros has uh, done even bigger <laughs> simulations, but nevertheless, the point is to make the simulation, you need uh, highly efficient codes. So we have a in-house code, Alswin, which scales to a very large number of GPUs has excellent memory bandwidth, good flops performance. And we did it on PSDAIN, the system that Petros knows very well, which at that time, sometime last year was sixth or the year before was sixth in top 500. It has slid down to 12th. And uh, as I said, I was proud of because the simulation is a very big one, right? Nevertheless, uh, it's sort of good to step back and ask myself, what exactly have I computed with the simulation? Yes, that's what the mathematician in me tells me. 
Uh, maybe nothing much. It was a very impressive simulation, but uh, nothing much. The reason for that is the following. If I even take a two-dimensional projection of what I showed you, or even just do the computation in two dimensions, and I do it on a sequence of grids, uh, so I start from 256 squared to 512 squared, 1024 squared, and they go on, as you can expect uh, doing fluid dynamics, that uh, you start small, getting smaller and smaller scale features. And when you look at the error, it just is a straight line. You don't really see any, any convergence. So what's the point of computing this? On the other hand, when you look at statistical quantities, instead of looking at a single simulation, if I do an ensemble of very related simulations, then you see, for instance, the mean, and there is very nice convergence. Now, this is not surprising to anyone doing fluid dynamics, but to sort of formalize it mathematically is not always easy. So one concept or one framework to formalize these considerations that individual realizations may not converge on mesh refinement, but as statistics might, is to use what are called statistical solutions, which is something that we have extensively developed in my group. So in statistical solutions, you don't consider a single function of space and time as your solution, rather you consider a probability measure and not any probability measure, you consider probability measure on a function space, for instance, uh, integrable functions. So let me give you a little bit of intuition about that. So our classical notion of solution says, if you fix time as a function of space, you just compute a single function. Whereas what I'm saying is, look at a bunch of functions and assign weights to them, such that these weights add up to one. So you have some weight here, some other weight here, some other weight here. And in this way, you form a probability measure on functions. It can happen that one of them has weight one and all the rest have weight zero. Then you have a Dirac measure and you're back on functions. Otherwise you generalize the notion of functions. It's a generalized notion of functions. And this is the object that surprisingly can be proved you know, under certain conditions that you can actually compute. What do I mean by that? So you start with a measure on a function space. This is an infinite dimensional Banach space. You start with a measure on a function space. You approximate the initial measure by sampling, for instance, then you have a numerical solution operator and you push it forward. So you just evolve it numerically and then you pass to the limit in the number of uh, mesh points that you have, in the number of samples. And we can prove actually that this limit is indeed a statistical solution. And in that process, what we prove is even if the deterministic quantities like individual realizations, they don't converge at all, all statistics that you can think of, not just mean and variance, but also point PDFs, structure functions, spectra, multipoint correlation functions, all the objects that you know from turbulence, all these quantities are well defined, they are computable, and you can approximate them. So that's brilliant, right? And you do that. So the same simulation that I showed you this uh, impressive graphics from, I take now on three different grids, uh, all the way to 1024 cubed. And you can see that when I look at a single sample, I don't see any convergence. But when I look at statistics, for instance, the mean and the variance, you can see visual convergence. And when you compute all these other quantities, you see very nice convergence. So statistics is what we want to compute, right? Now comes the dirty little secret. <laughs> so all these impressive simulations, code, and so on, and we have to compute statistics. But the point is, even for a 1024 cubed run, on this uh, platform, on this HPC platform, we needed something like 280 node hours, okay? Now you start, uh, you have to do something like 500 of these, right? You have to get some statistics out of it. Otherwise the single simulation has no meaning. So when you start doing statistics, you have to do 500 simulations at 280 node hours. And then you start asking what is the cost of this computation? Now, of course we do it for free because we have some projects and so on, but CSCF, Yes, the agency, the institution that runs this big machine, it has a program by which you can pay to compute. And even with my academic discount, and even with my ETH discount on top of it, because ETH runs this, still a single simulation, ensemble simulation, would cost me 700,000 700, US dollars. So that's a lot of money for a single simulation. And just imagine if you have to compute statistics in every fluid uh, dynamic simulation at this scale, how much money it is. And quickly you realize that this is not the way forward in the future because things are getting stuck, things are getting more expensive, power is getting more expensive. We have to find a way out. And the, the, let me abstract this problem because this problem is a specific example of what is called an uncertainty quantification problem. 
which in turn is a specific example of what is called a many query problem. So what is a many query problem? Many query problem is exactly this, that okay, it, it's expensive for me, but I can compute a single simulation. But to do 500 of this, 1000 of this is prohibitively expensive. So whenever you do multiple calls to PDE solvers, this thing is very expensive. Uncertainty quantification is a typical example of that. Well, not the only example, right? Because let's think about design. Uh, for instance, uh, just for simplicity, you want to design an airfoil, you want to change the shape of an airfoil so that you minimize drag at constant lift or maximize the lift to drag ratio or something like that. Again, you have to run an optimization loop. Each time you run an optimization loop, you have to compute gradients, you have to ev evaluate the PDE solver maybe a hundred times, maybe a thousand times. And remember this, one solve is feasible, probably expensive, but a thousand solves are very expensive. So it is in the context of these kind of problems that machine learning could, under the right conditions, give us some advantages. And let me try to explain this in a little bit, put a little bit of formalism around it. So remember that I'm interested in this uh, many query problems. One way I can write them is in this parametric form. So D is a differential operator. Think of whatever Euler equations, Navier-Stokes heat equation. And U is a solution. It depends on space. It depends on time. And it depends on parameters. These parameters, for instance, could be the design parameters. So what are called higgs henne functions in aerodynamics. There could be some parameters which describe the uncertainty, uh, for instance, the probability space. And the point is that for different values of this parameter, you have to evaluate the PDE multiple times, right? So either the solution in field, or in many cases, you can get away just with observable, like a lift or a drag, but nevertheless. So these are the typical examples of a many query problem. And the high dimensionality, which I advertised in my abstract, comes from the fact that the parameters are high dimensional. Even if the space and time is four dimensional in this case, uh, the parameters can be high dimensional. Even in this very simple design problem, it's anywhere between 20 to 50 dimensions. So this is where the high dimensionality can come from. And what we're going to do is we're not going to, uh, for each realization of the parameter, call the PDE solver. Rather, we're going to approximate the field or the observable with neural networks. So this is where the deep learning part of it comes from. So these days, everyone knows what deep neural networks are. I don't have to spend much time. But just for notation, uh, deep neural networks in my context are functions. So they start with the input space, which could be a very high dimensional parametric space, vector space, y. And they give you an output, which could be a number, which could be a vector, and so on. And the way to build this function is through compositions of simple functions, right? And these simple functions are either affine. So across each layer, hidden layers, as they are called in uh, machine learning, you have these affine functions with the weights and biases. And then you have this little scalar nonlinearities, ReLU or tan -H or sigmoid or whatever. And then you repeat it. You keep on concatenating and composing. And if your target function, uh, which is uh, what I denote here by L, is your target function, and to learn it, I need some training data. Typically, one takes it as random, the data set as random. So you take random samples in your parameter space, and you form the training set, and then you train your parameters, so train your neural network, these parameters, weights, and biases to minimize some loss functions. So this is uh, machine learning in this context in a nutshell. So, okay, so my idea was that I'm going to replace my solution fields or my observables with this neural network. And this is the recipe for doing it. Right? Everyone do, does it these days. Can it be done? In other words, can I find a neural network such that uh, the error that I make in learning my original function, as I said, it could be a um, solution field, it could be an observable with a small error? The answer is yes, because neural networks are universal approximators. So as long as this function is measurable, well, I'm fine. I can do that. However, this is where the but comes in, right? You have, you have to think about what is the architecture, what is the complexity, what is the size of the problem that I need to approximate. And here's a typical result, which comes from approximation theory, which tells you that if your function has a certain Sobolev regularity, if let's say it has S integrable derivatives, then this is the complexity that you get. So your error for this neural network, there exists a neural network, is that the error scales like this. Okay. 
So it depends on the regularity of your map and it depends on the dimension. And here comes the catch, right? Because in scientific computing, often, like for instance, just imagine this, I have a shock here. So you can't have a lot of regularity. And often the dimension is large. As I said, in this design problem, it could be 20 to 50 dimensions already. So then when you plug these numbers, even for a very moderate dimensional problem, six dimensions, assume my drag or lift is Lipschitz continuous, which is not unreasonable. Then what I get is to get 1% error, I need a network which is uh, having a trillion parameters. So this tells you that this approximation theory just doesn't work in this context if you use it directly because you are hit by the curse of dimensionality because things grow exponentially in dimension. And once they grow exponentially in dimension, this is not a good idea. So we need to do something. And this analysis is a bit crude because uh, it doesn't take into the fact that we are solving a PDE. It just says a general function, what happens? So if you're solving a PDE, or in general, you can, decom you do, you can do a little bit more refined analysis. So you decompose the error into these three parts. Let me walk through each of them. This, let's say, more mathy slide that I have. The first error is the approximation. So this is the best approximation tells you that there will be a neural network in the class of neural networks that you're looking for, the architecture, the activation function, and so on, which approximates the function. And remember, this is what was uh, being exponential in terms of dimension. But since these are solutions of PDEs, they have a little bit more structure and different people, including us, for instance, for nonlinear hyperbolic PDEs, we have proved, proved that this is not really exponential, it's rather polynomial. For instance, for nonlinear hyperbolic PDs, the dependence of dimension is either linear, or if it's only the, if the initial data is parameterized, or it's quadratic if the flux is parameterized. So it's much better than exponential, which is a good thing, right? Uh, the optimization error is something that is uh, given completely in terms of the training error. I'm going to comment about it a little bit later, but essentially you can monitor it. When you're training, you have a handle on this, you can calculate it from your loss function. The third part of the error is what is called the generalization. This is this term here, which says that I'm replacing a population risk, an integral, with um, what is called empirical risk, or uh, let's say a quadrature. So this is essentially some sort of a quadrature error, and you can use some statistical learning theory techniques, um, fairly standard these days, to bound it like this. So the operative word here is that your generalization error up to a log scales like square root of the number of samples. Not surprising, right? Think of Monte Carlo. The error goes like a square root, and this is exactly what is happening here. So if you take these considerations together and put them up, let's say that your problem is such where you can prove that the approximation error is small. You can train your neural network such that the optimization error is small. What you're left with, and this is what I call as well-trained networks, what you're left with is something like this that your generalization error, and hence your overall error, behaves like uh, the square root, essentially, of the number of samples, which is, in a way, good news, in a way, bad news. Why? Because if I have, uh, let's say, 1% error, which is a typical number, then I would need 10,000 samples. OK, 10,000 samples doesn't seem like a lot. But remember where I come from, right? Each of my samples is very expensive. And if I have to generate 10,000 of them, then again, it's prohibitively expensive. This still doesn't scale that well. And this in a way highlights the central message of my talk that often in scientific computing, we have to learn maps of low regularity. Okay, this is an important point. And in a very relatively data poor regime, because our data comes from simulations, we don't have access to 100,000 images or to a million words or a million sentences like the traditional machine learning applications have. So this is a challenge, and I will show a couple of tricks where we try on some examples where we try to overcome the challenge. The first trick, which is a very obvious one, it's surprising that people hadn't thought of it in this context, is, <clears throat> as I said, often one uses random training points, right? This is the standard statistical learning theory framework. But who tells us to do that? After all, we're generating our data through simulations, so I can use different training points. One choice, for instance, is to use what are called low discrepancy sequences. Uh, for instance, the SOBOL sequences. This is a common example. So as you can imagine, these sequences, 
these are better distributed in your parameter space. Just look at this picture here. The blue dots are the random points. And there are many of these uh, squares where these dots are missing. The orange on the other hand are the so-called points. And as you can see, these are better spread out. So this equidistribution property means that I better represent the parameter space if I use a low discrepancy sequence. And this has been used, for instance, in quasi Monte Carlo, quasi Monte Carlo integration. So if you do that, we can prove some things. For instance, uh, as long as the function has bounded variation, hardy krause variation, then you can prove that the generalization error scales like one over n. Of course, there's a log here. One over n with respect to the uh, number of samples. So remember where I'm coming from. I'm coming from one over square root of n, right? By changing the training points, of course, the cost is still the same, whether you use a so point or a random point to call the PDE solver, the cost is still the same. But because of this equidistribution property, I get a much more favorable scale. And you see that in this example, for instance, the random points, the scale is 0 0.65, slightly better than half, and the SOBOL scales as one, so you get uh, order of magnitude speed up just by at the same cost by doing nothing. Of course, if you want to get rid of the log and if you want to get even better with respect to the exponent here, you need a little bit more structure in your function. For instance, in many elliptic and parabolic PDEs, our map L is analytic or holomorphic. Then you can use some special low discrepancy sequences and you can see that there is a quadratic uh, decay of the error. And it's also dim completely dimension independent. There is no curse of dimensionality whatsoever, but it is special for elliptic and parabolic PDs. So changing the training points is one good idea in this respect. Another idea which uh, many people have used, uh, but in this context, maybe we are among the first to do, is to use what we call multi-fidelity or multi-level training. Now, in numerical simulations, we, we have this idea, we have this issue that we can compute at different resolutions, right? So of course, it's very expensive to compute at the finest resolution that you have. Cheap to compute at a coarse resolution. The idea is to combine them. And in many problems, this works. So what we do is, instead of taking all the training samples at the finest resolution, you take a lot of training samples at the coarse resolution, a few at a finer resolution, and very few at the finest resolution. And then you combine them by what are called this sort of telescopic expansions. So you have a function, which is decomposed at the function of the closest level of resolution and the details, the differences between two different levels of resolution. So you train instead of a single neural network, some neural networks, uh, eight or 10 or six, depending on the level of resolution you have. And then one can guarantee that there will be a speed up over a single level, the traditional way of uh, doing machine learning. If you do this, if the variance has a certain decay, and again, this works in practice. For instance, for the aerofoil example, you have a speed up of about five to six. So still considerable, nothing, not a huge number, but still considerable. So by using these kind of tricks, you can reduce uh, the computational cost that is necessary for training, and you can apply this. So let me give you a few examples where we have used this uh, ideas. <clears throat> the first is prediction. So. It, Again, let me concretize this for the aerofoil example. So I parameterize the airfoil by this Higgs and parameters. These are spline-like functions that describe the shape. And then for each parameter or each parameter vector, I have to predict the drag, the lift, and the flow field. And this is, for instance, the density, the to ground truth, and this is what the neural network gives you. So with a very few samples, 128 samples, and relatively small networks, my networks are between 1,000 and 10,000 parameters, you can see that the, this is the sort of overall summary. So to generate a single sample, it's a two-dimensional Euler equations uh, solver, it, it took you about 40 minutes of uh, wall clock time. To train these networks, uh, it takes 10 to 15 minutes for the observables. It takes an hour for the whole field. But remember, this is for a single sample. For 128 samples, the cost is 100, and 100 hours, right? To evaluate these networks uh, during runtime, this is extremely cheap. So this is 10 to the power minus five seconds. Even for the whole field, it is 0 0.2 seconds. So remember, there are almost uh, three to four orders of magnitude less. And the errors, as you can see, for the lift, 1%, for the drag, 2%, for the whole field, 2.5%. 
So for the whole field, you can learn the whole field with some error, 2.5% in this case, but at a cost, which is um, three or four orders of magnitude smaller. So it's very powerful as a surrogate in these kind of prediction tasks. But prediction is only one thing that you can do. Another thing that one can do is uncertainty quantification. Now, uncertainty quantification is what I started out with. So in uncertainty quantification, you propagate measures, right? You propagate. In this case, you forward propagate measures. So you sample them by either Monte Carlo or quasi Monte Carlo. And what we do in our algorithm is very simple. We take a few samples, 128 or 64. We train a neural network. And remember that this neural network is very, very cheap to evaluate. So we can do hundreds of thousands of simulations very, very quickly. And we use that as a surrogate to do our Monte Carlo or quasi Monte Carlo sampling. So it works very well. Uh, here are some examples. This is the whole PDF of the lift. You can see that it compares very well with the ground truth. The same with the drag. And when we look at the cost over Monte Carlo, this is a lot of speed up, a fair speed up of about 180 to 250. And even over the state of the art is quasi Monte Carlo for these problems, it is still about seven to nine. And if you do multi-level, remember this uh, details and training things on a, on a set of details, then you get another factor of three to five. So between 30 and 50 speed up over the state of the art. I think that's, that's quite considerable in this context. As another example, which is very interesting, and uh, as you see, a bit non-intuitive, is to do PDE constraint optimization, design. So what do we do in design? In design, we often have to solve a problem like this. Uh, L is some solution of the PDE, or lift, drag, whatever you think of. This is some cost function. And you want to find parameters, design parameters, so that this cost function is optimized. So what is the algorithm that one can use? Just like in uncertainty quantification, why don't we take a few samples, train the neural networks, and do all the optimization on the trained neural network? by using BFGS or whatever fancy optimization algorithm we have. Now, this doesn't work. Unlike our uncertainty quantification, this naive algorithm doesn't work. And the reason is very intuitive. You can see already on this picture, it's just a 2D example. So the point is when we train a neural network, we choose this um, training points IID, we choose them as low discrepancy sequences, we try to fill up the whole parameter space. However, our optimizer, optima, lie on some sort of a manifold. In this case, they lie on the parabola. So it's on a sub-manifold of, of your whole space that you have the optimization happening. And of course, unless until you have a lot of points, you're not going to fill it very well. That's why this algorithm doesn't work, the naive algorithm. What works is what is an active learning algorithm, which we developed. So what we do in this, and let me try to explain uh, sort of intuitively what's going on is the following, right? So we have, uh, by the way, Petros, uh, should I, rem uh, I started five minutes late, right? So I can uh, take you that can, you can have You can have your extra five minutes. <laughs> okay, just, just, <laughs> no worries. just to, so let me try to explain this. So remember that we don't have a good idea of the optima unless until we have a lot of points. So what do we do? We have an iterative algorithm. So we iteratively select the training points for our neural network. So we start with a few points on the whole space, and then we train the neural network, which will be a poor representation, let's say. And then we try to run BFGS on that. And this gives us a set of new training points. And because we're iterating, you can see that the minima here, or the optima, is better captured. And these are your new training points. So the neural network is approximating locally better near the optima. And then you go on for the next iterate. This is after three, three iterates. And you can see the parabola is getting filled up much better. And one can even do some analysis for the convex case. And one sees that this iteration between the teacher, which is the BFGS, and the learner, which is the neural network. This is why it's an active learning algorithm. It gives you a very nice uh, convergence. And you see that in practice, uh, same problem, uh, where we want to design an airfoil to minimize drag. And you can see that this was your reference airfoil that you started off with. These are some optimized shapes. And what you get is about 50% drag reduction at near constant lift. But the important thing is here that uh, this is a, let's say, state of the art optimization algorithm. 
And you can see that uh, with a new algorithm, we are about, we are much faster, right? With a uh, few samples, we are more or less get the same drag reduction as this traditional algorithm does with a lot of calls. So you get again a factor of 20, 25 speed up for these algorithms. So all these algorithms that I just described give you a speed up of about uh, 20, 25. That is, that is great, right? But what about statistical solutions? The thing that I started out with, where we have to compute a full probability measure. If someone can give me a factor of 30 speed up, my problem is solved. Because in that case, instead of $700,000, I can uh, pay $20,000, which is a much more affordable price. But this is not so easy. Why is that? Because remember what I told you, that the object that we are seeking in this context was a probability measure on a function space. It is no longer a parameterized measure on a finite dimensional space. So, and what you needed, it was an operator that was moving forward this measure. So let's recapitulate that. So for statistical solutions and for many other applications, your object that you're interested in is a probability measure on a function space and an operator that maps one function space, infinite dimensional Banach space to another. And many, many PDE problems can be recast in this form. Right, where instead of learning just a function, like the, let's say the drag is a function of the shape, what you have to learn is the solution of the PDE, for instance, as a function of the initial data. And these kind of problems are what are called operator learning problems. These are really infinite dimensional problems because your input spaces and output spaces are going to be functions. So to, to evaluate statistical solutions, I need to do operator learning. And this is not, uh, it's slowly, it's getting more and more fashionable, but it's, it's a difficult problem. One thing that uh, we prefer, or at least we have analyzed, is what are called depot nets. Now, this is a, there's a strong Greek influence here, because George Kaniadakis, who is a good friend of Petros, is the person who found it out. This has been around, this framework for operator learning has been around by Chen and Chen from about the 1990s, but uh, George sort of rejuvenated it. And they've done a lot of impressive calculations with that in the last one year or six months even. Let me explain to you a little bit what this uh, object is, what this depot net is, because it's a novel architecture, right? So the idea is that you're going to learn functions or operators mapping functions to functions. So input is going to be a function, the output is going to be a function. So what you do is you take a function, evaluate it at some points. This is some sort of encoding. And then you push the out, so reduce a function to a vector, encode a function to a vector, push it through a neural network, and get a bunch of coefficients. But this is not enough, right? Because my output also has to be a function. So to get a function in the output space, I need to somehow span the output space. And this is done by another neural network, which is called a trunk net. And then you combine these two in another step. OK, so you have two sets of neural networks. One is a branch net which acts at the input end, and one is a trunk net, which acts at the output end, and you train them simultaneously with respect to another mesh. So it's a, it's a novel architecture. It has been around for a while, but the question is, why should this work? Why should this approximate operators? So this is an interesting question, which has at least been partially answered in this paper. It's a very new preprint. It was put on archive on Monday. And the reason is the following. We are able to prove that uh, this mapping, as long as it is measurable with respect to an input measure, you can learn it. And this is exactly the same level of approximation result that has been proved as universal approximation in the finite dimensional case. And we have upper bounds, we have lower bounds. And the more difficult question here is, OK, you can learn it. But what about the complexity? Because since we have an infinite dimensional problem, you can easily hit the curse of dimensionality because now the dimensions are infinite, right? So what if it depends exponentially on that? So what we prove actually in a bunch of examples, that's why it's a very long paper, is that they can theoretically, at least, it can, we can prove that they break the curse of dimensionality. Let me give an example. There are several examples here, but let me give you one concrete one. So think of an elliptic problem. Let's say Darcy's flow, right? This is the rock permeability, and this is your input to the mapping. Your output is the pressure head, uh, like in a Darcy's flow, so Darcy's flow in this particular case. And what you're mapping is uh, this into the, into the pressure head. And what we're able to prove <clears throat> in this particular context is that you get an error of epsilon with the depot net, 
and the complexity of the depot net is subalgebraic, means it is better than it doesn't even grow like any polynomial. Forget about linear, it grows as sublinear or subalgebraic. So it's really almost optimal complexity. So this architecture has this inbuilt feature that it can approximate operators, nonlinear operators of PDEs. The PDE itself is linear, but the operator is nonlinear in a very efficient manner. You also have bounds on the generalization error, but these are more expected. What is unexpected is this sort of, that it breaks the course of dimensionality in this manner. And when you do numerics with this, uh, George has done many more uh, numerics than what we have. What we observe is that the error, this uh, goes exponentially down with the number of sensors. Remember that in this encoding step, and you have some very, very fast training. So it goes exponentially with the number of samples, at least initially. What we proved is asymptotically, it will be square root of n. But if it, initially it goes exponentially, then you train very fast. But we don't have a proof of that. But given that we observe this consistently, and we have all these results about breaking the curse of dimensionality, we are hopeful that this is what can approximate statistical solutions with deep we are, we are very hopeful of that. So let me, I have a, approximately 10 minutes left, 10, 12 minutes left. Let me switch gears and talk about another set of high dimensional problems. So what I've described now is dimensions which are parametric, parametric dimensions. But sometimes in PDEs, you have the physical dimensions, spatial dimensions are high, right? Boltzmann, for instance, where the total number of dimensions is seven, radiative transfer, and then the Black-Scholes and the Schrodinger's equations, the dimensions can be of hundreds and thousands and so on. In these cases, the algorithms that I described um, these are not, not that important because uh, you can't just generate data from simulation anymore. So you really have to solve these PDEs for every single, let's say, set of data. And for that, what we are going to do is another Greek product, which is physics-informed neural networks. This was again uh, introduced by Lajaris. I, maybe I got to get the pronunciation wrong in the 1990s. But the person who really found it and developed it extensively is George. And what our contribution contribution is, uh, is we provide theory, why this works, and we focus more on the high dimensional problems. So let me just give you a couple of examples of that. So what are these pins, uh, physics informed neural networks? Many people talk about them these days, but they're very simple objects. Because remember that uh, this is an abstract PDE. So you have uh, D of U, this is your differential operator. This is your right hand side. Think of the heat equation or the Euler equations or whatever. And now my neural networks are mappings. There are no parameters for simplicity. You can also incorporate them. These are mappings from physical space and time to your phase space, uh, vector or scalar, depending on your problem. Now, of course, this is a neural network. As long as it is smooth, you can always evaluate the residual. Just plug the neural network into the PDE. And of course, this is not going to be zero. Otherwise, it would have been a solution of the PDE. So the idea is you simply minimize the residual in some norm. Uh, typically an LP norm. Uh, you can't minimize the residual because it's an integral, so you minimize the quadrature. Okay, you minimize the quadrature, you minimize the residual. Why should this lead to a solution of the PDE? And the answer is essentially in these three lines. So let me just quickly present that. So in this paper, what we found out is that as long as your PDE is stable, so by stability is essentially this estimate. So these are the out inputs to your PDE, your right-hand side in this context, and if the change in the inputs is small, there should be a proportionate change in the outputs. So this is all that it says. And there are plenty of PDEs which satisfy this, right? So now my error is the difference between the pin and the exact solution. But since my PDE is stable, you just substitute this relationship here. Now remember that I'm solving a PDE. This is U is the exact solution. So DU is equal to F, okay? So now you have uh, the differential operator applied to the pin minus the right hand side. But what is that? That is precisely your residual at the trained pin. So now the residual is an uh, integral. I should approximate it by quadrature with the loss function. And that is what it is. So this is the final estimate. It tells you that if your training error is small and if you have sufficient number of quadrature points, and if these guys don't blow up, then your PDE is approximated very nicely by a pin. So here is a nutshell, is an error estimate for pins for the forward problem. And of course, the difficulty is that for each PDE, one has to check this. This, this, this can be done, and this has been done. 
for instance, for the heat equation, uh, maybe I don't spend so much of time here. Uh, for the heat equation, this has been done. It's very easy to check this. Uh, you can see that how the residual comes in. So you have some training points and you just put the residual, minimize the residual on the training points. You minimize the variation with respect to the initial data because there will be a mismatch. Minimize the mismatch with respect to the boundary data. And then you get a pin and you prove an error estimate like this. One can confirm that this indeed holds. I don't want to dwell on it. But one interesting fact about it is now heat equation. I can consider the heat equation in 20 dimensions, 50 dimensions, 100 dimensions, and we do that. And you can see that the error here is behaving very nicely. Even in 100 dimensions, it's only two and a half percent. And it grows only linearly. So this suggests that there is no curse of dimensionality. And there is some theoretical analysis in this forthcoming paper. So pins don't suffer from a curse of dimensionality, and you can actually prove it. So why not apply that? And for instance, we have applied it to PDEs in finance, like Black-Scholes type PDEs or Heston PDEs and so on, where you can go to 100 or 200 dimensions and you get like one to 2% error. And these are not uh, very long computations. This is like half an hour. So you can solve the problem in 100 to 200 dimensions in half an hour to 1% or 2% error. That's, that's quite, and you use no information. Only the, you just minimize the residual and minimize the mismatches with the initial and boundary data. And you can even prove what you see. That's, that's, that's a very nice thing here. Uh, a more physics oriented PD, which I think is uh, maybe more relevant for this audience, are the radiative transfer equations, which come up in a variety of contexts. <laughs> and uh, so you approximate the radiative intensity, U, which is a function of space, three dimensions, time, one dimension, angle, because radiation is along all rays, so two dimensions more, and frequency, one more dimension. So in general, this could be seven dimensions. It's also a non-local problem because you have a scattering kernel. Uh, you have some hyperbolic, some transport domination, but uh, depending, it could also be parabolic if you're a very opaque or a very transparent regime. And you can apply pins, and here are the results. Let me very quickly show you the results. So here's a two-dimensional problem. So one space and one angle, you get 0.3% error in 60 minutes. Okay, nothing impressive. For the next one, I still keep 60 minutes and I compute a six-dimensional problem. So you have three space, two angle, and one frequency. This is uh, stationary. And you get only 2% error. And you do it on 60 minutes in a single GPU. So you solve the radiative transfer problem, which is not always easy to solve, on a GPU in 60 minutes. Now let me, uh, so pin scan and do solve high dimensional problems. Let me skip uh, the slide that I showed you. Of course, pins don't work all the time. Since this is, uh, it's not like every PDE can be solved using pins. A typical example is hyperbolic PDEs, like the ones that I started out with, nonlinear hyperbolic PDEs. Because again, uh, the error estimate tells you that around shocks, pins shouldn't work. Uh, the constant should blow up. And you see that, you see that in practice also. The theory and the practice are completely consistent that the error does not decay once you have shocks. On the other hand, for a rarefaction where the gradients are bounded, the error is very, very nice. So there are limitations to what pins can do, but when they work, they work like a charm. Of course, there are ways to make them work even in cases where you have shocks and so on, but maybe I just skip that and maybe I can come to it in the questions. Uh, before I finish, I want to focus on a very important aspect of pins that uh, they're very powerful for solving inverse problems. They were good for forward problems, high dimensions, but of course, uh, they're really, they come into their own when it comes to inverse problems. And let me talk, talk about a couple of inverse problems. The first is uh, data simulation or unique continuation. So you have Stokes flow, just for simplicity here, and you don't know the boundary conditions, but you know some uh, values in the interior. You have some data, actual observed data of the velocity, but not of the pressure in the interior of the domain. And you want to know the value of the velocity and the pressure everywhere. So how do you use a pin? Remember, use the PDE. So put the PDE residual everywhere and just append the data points. So this is the beauty of these the networks that they're able to append data or use data very easily, right? So just append it, minimize the whole thing. And you can even prove by using some deep mathematics that this thing works. There are something called Kalman estimates that you can use to prove it. 
And uh, in practice, it works very well. Even in the very few points, 80 squared, you get an error of about one and a half percent. And this is like one minute or two minutes of training time and 3.5% uh, for the pressure, which is a bit, bit on the higher side. And this is for data simulation problems. Also for classical inverse problems, like uh, remember radiative transfer, this difficult PDE. Now the inverse problem would be that I have some measurements of the intensity or even more the measurements of the radiation, which is the angular moment of the intensity. And you have to compute uh, what is the coefficient of absorption. This is a typical inverse problem, classical inverse problem. Pins work very well. The theory is not yet there, but uh, in practice, it works very well. Five dimensional problem, 90 minutes, uh, one and a half hours, 100 minutes. And the errors that you get, even for the coefficient, is about 3%. And this is an inverse problem. So it, it, you can't get better than that. So inverse problems, the way they seamlessly combine data to the PDE is one of the big strengths of PITS. Of course, they have their limitations, uh, particularly shock-dominated irregular problems and so on. OK, so maybe I quickly summarize what I tried to do, because I'm uh, more or less. Do I have five more minutes or three more minutes, Petros? <laughs> finish in peace. Huh? You can, you can finish smoothly. No, yeah, so I can finish smoothly, yes, because I wanted to highlight something very important, right? So what I wanted to show is how deep learning can affect or can even accelerate or enhance computations of PDEs. So in that context, I showed you different tricks on how to do parametric PDEs, uh, in particular, um, low discrepancy training, active learning, and so on. Also, I wanted to highlight that you can do even operator learning, which is really infinite dimensional machine learning using depot nets. And I wanted to highlight uh, pins because they are very good for both high dimensional forward problems as well as inverse problems. And we also have some theory for that. But the main message that I wanted to convey here is whenever I talk to my computer science colleagues, they say, oh, what's the big deal? It means uh, you're just using some black box uh, machine learning algorithms. As Petros knows uh, also in his own work, this is never the case. It means, uh, and what I wanted to try and convey is that each of these applications required significant innovation over the black box machine learning algorithms. Otherwise, you would not be able to do some of these problems at all. So if you just try with a black box machine learning algorithm, you get nowhere. So you really have to innovate. But the other complaint that they have, and this is what I wanted to end with, is, OK, fine, you use some black box machine learning algorithms, but uh, what can you give to us? Can you solve any of our problems using all your tricks? Uh, in general, no. Right, because uh, there is a lot of activity where people are trying to use differential equations to improve machine learning algorithms. Uh, some people have succeeded in doing that, uh, but still state of the art is missing in many, many cases. But let me give you an example in just two minutes of uh, one little sliver where by using differential equations, we could get state of the art on machine learning problems in computer science. And this comes with uh, recurrent neural networks. I know that Petros has been interested in this topic. I think, Paulos, you have been interested in this topic. So many people have worked on this. So I just will end with that. So recurrent neural networks are the architecture of choice for time series. When you have time series inputs, the output could be a time series, could be a number. But these are the architecture of choice. So here is the graphical representation. So at every time step, you are given an external input, and you produce a hidden state. Uh, with the same architecture, with the same weights and biases. And using these two, or these two rather, you produce the next state and you keep on doing it. So that's a recurrent uh, neural network. And you have uh, very successful examples, LSTMs, GRUs, and so on. So one of the problems, which is well known now, is due to what is called long time dependencies. Remember that you have to remember things. The network has to remember things. And it tends to, if you have very long sequences, the inputs in the beginning tend to be forgotten by the outputs at the end. And it was Benjo, I think, or maybe someone else, who beautifully brought it out mathematically by saying that all that you do is you have to apply chain rule. So your loss function at this time step with respect to a parameter by the chain rule can be written like this, just chain rule. And these derivatives here can be written by product rule, so by successive gradients. So you just take the gradient of this hidden state with the next one, this one with this one, this one with this one, and so on. So what you end up is a long product. And as we know, long products are dangerous, right? So in, if on an average, 
this is less than one, then on an average, they will go to zero very quickly because just imagine multiplying 100 numbers which are small or multiplying 100 numbers which are large, so they will explode. So this is what is called the exploding and vanishing gradient problem. There are some solutions to it, uh, many solutions to it, but RNNs, uh, this is a big problem for RNNs. That's why people have changed to transformers and other architectures. So our thinking was, uh, why not use differential equations? Other people have also thought about it. Why not use differential equations, but special kind of differential equations, just ODEs in this particular case. And uh, I first started looking at brain circuits, right? How do brain circuits remember things? So if you look at a cortical column or a prefrontal cortex, these are full of oscillators. So there are many, many oscillators there. So why don't we abstract that idea and use networks of oscillators? So the first architecture that we came up with was coupled oscillators with some damping. And in fact, in this case, with, and then of course, you have to solve this ODE numerically. So we use the IMAX discretization. And under certain conditions of the weights, we are rigorously able to prove that the exploding and vanishing gradient problem can be solved, can be mitigated. And this paper was received very favorably, surprisingly favorably by the machine learning community. We also got an oral at the forthcoming ICLR, so we are, we are happy about it. But very soon we realized that there are some issues with it because these conditions might not be that easy to meet. So we modified the architecture a bit, bit here and we said, okay, forget the damping. If you forget the damping and if you make this neurons independent, then you get a Hamiltonian system. Right? A Hamiltonian system is a very, very nice thing because we have Liouville's theorem. There's a time dependent Hamiltonian system you have Liouville's theorem. As many of you know, the phase space volume is always going to be uh, constant. Right? It's maintained by the flow. So if you, you can't really shrink things to zero that easily, or you can't really say expand things to infinity. So in phase space, you keep the volume and we leverage this to prove that the EVGP, this exploding and vanishing gradient problem can be solved. There are many other advantages because it's a Hamiltonian system, it's invertible, so the implementation is fast, it's memory efficient. In fact, at the moment, it is one of the fastest architectures for doing RNNs. It's a very fast RNN architecture, but does it work in practice? Uh, it does. And here's an example. It's a very classic example, which is suggested by Jeff Hinton. So these are the MNIST images, and the aim is to classify them, right? You want to classify them. But now, instead of giving the whole image to the neural network, you give it one pixel at a time as a sequence. So, the, and you perturb it randomly so that uh, things are decoupled a bit. So it's a sequence of length 784, classic example for checking long time dependencies. And we are really state of the art here. So we are at 97, 98. So we are really state of the art here. And this was the primary reason why our paper was uh, sort of viewed so favorably. But 784, okay, is that a big sequence? Here comes a big sequence, and I'm, I'm happy to present this at Harvard, which has this big medical school. So this is C. elegans, the classic worm of neurobiology. It moves on an agar plate, and based on its motion, you produce some time series. And the point is, using this time series, you can classify. You can say whether it's a wild type or four different types of mutants. So the motion is completely the, the defined in terms of the genetics of the worm. So there are five classes. And the sequence length here is enormous, it's 18,000. So it's a really genuinely long sequence. And as you can see, LSTM, for instance, doesn't work at all, but uh, some smarter versions of it give you 60 to 70% accuracy, but we are like at 90% accuracy. So it's a very, very long, uh, very, very sort of a good result. This is a mean result. Our best result here is 96% or 95% There's some standard deviation, but nevertheless. It's a, it's a good result. And this is an interesting academic problem, uh, but uh, in practical problems, for instance, these days, everyone is measuring heart rates, oxygen levels, and so on with pulse oximeters. So you have this PPG and ECG signals, time series of length 4,000, a relatively long sequence. And you want to measure the respiration rate and heart rate. Again, uh, at least among RNNs, we are actually state of the art here. So as you can see over LSTM, it's almost a factor of um, seven or eight uh, gain. So that's a, that's a considerable gain. So in this little sliver, at least, we have been able to show that by using differential equations, you can design machine learning algorithms, which can beat the state of the art. Now imagine how many differential equations we have, 
how many dynamical systems we have. So there is an opportunity here to come out with innovative architectures, which can probably beat some of the machine learning algorithms that we have on the computer science tasks, not just on our scientific computing tasks. So I think with this, I, I, I am sorry about taking some extra time, but uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Sid, for this uh, wonderful talk. I very much enjoyed it. Um, so mm -hmm. I will turn the uh, floor over to Pavlos, who's going to be running the questions and answer session. Thank you, Petros. Thank you, Sid. Excellent. I'm glad you took the extra time because that's quite the interesting part. Uh, uh, we have we have some time for some questions. I don't see the Q and A. Maybe we just raise hands. Uh, Kathy, do you see the participants in the chat? Well, I, I see I see the Q and A, and you do. Uh, I can uh, communicate one. It's can uh, you because Yang I don't Kwan. see it. I, it's from Yang Quan Chen, and he says, "Can you talk more on long time dependence and its connection to long memory? How important it is and how to deal with it." Okay, so of course I'll be happy to talk about it. Uh, in fact, I enjoy question and answer because then I can slow down. <laughs> okay, so here is uh, the explanation of, uh, so memory in this case is simply, so we, we are training the network, right? We are training a neural network. So there are these parameters, the weights and biases, which are implicitly written here. And uh, so now the idea is that your total loss function is going to be, <clears throat> Sorry. So total loss function is a loss function that is summed over all the inputs over the time series. So remember the C elegans, you have 18,000 inputs or 18,000 members of the sequence and you sum over all of them. And the point is you want to find the effect of, uh, let's say the 10th member of the sequence on the 17,000th member of the sequence. That is, that is memory, right? So that is having a very long memory. So in mathematical terms, this is, uh, as I said, this just this chain rule, which means that to remember at the tth time step, think of the 17,000th element from the 100th time step, okay? So to go from the 100 to the 17,000th is this long product. This is just product rule because uh, the input at any given time is the previous time step, but the, the previous time step is the next time step, previous time step and so on, right? So the long memory here, is because you have this very, very long product. So if you want to, if you want to remember anything, you better have this product and either be, either if it's too small, then you don't remember anything. Or if it is too large, then the whole thing blows up and you can't train it. So the concept of long memory here is in terms of the strength of this product. So ideally you'd like this product to be close to one, right? Because the closer it is to one, then you keep on having memory all the time. And people have, uh, so LSTM, for instance, uh, by gating, you try to keep uh, this, uh, so you cannot, you cannot vanish because it's at least greater than one. You gate and you forget and you gate and you forget, but it can still explode. So this is, uh, this is one of the problems. Other people have suggested architectures where somehow use orthogonal matrices because orthogonal matrices have unit norm, right? What we say is if you use symplectic matrices, so there's a symplectic discretization of a Hamiltonian system, then you also keep the norm near one. But you don't have to explicitly do it. You do it implicitly because Hamiltonian systems are inbuilt to keep this norm near one somehow. At least they not let you have the norm shrink to zero or to blow up to infinity. So it's, it's sort of a very hand wavy way of describing what I just said. Uh, one has to do the estimation. But the long memory here is a product of design. But at the same time, you need to have some expressivity and the architecture should be able to not, uh, because if I just keep zero, the memory is, <laughs> or keep a constant, then you have as, as long memory as you want, right? But uh, at the same time, you don't learn anything. So the balance between the two is difficult, but oscillators are good, right? Because they, they are able to, means the brain uses oscillators. Well, I'm not a neurobiologist, but if you look at the neurobiology literature, the memory circuits in the brain, a lot of the functional circuits in the brain are based on uh, remembering, are based on oscillators. So it makes sense to use oscillators to design uh, neural networks. But in this case, we use the very abstract form of it, the simplest form of it. These have nothing to do with the real oscillators that they're in the brain. These are, these are much more complicated equations. So maybe they will do even better. 
but uh, this I don't know. I hope I answered your question, Yang, Yang Chuan. I hope I got the name right. Uh, someone is asking, is Unicorn published? Uh, yeah, Pet Petros today. Uh, posted it, yeah. Yes, today. I, I, I posted the paper, uh, Sid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, the corn has already been published, uh, or it has. It's uh, it, it will be published in ICLR conference. Unicorn has already been submitted, but it will be on archive either today or over the weekend. So you will get it. Seems uh, that is. It seems that Petros found it and published it, uh, posted it. Is that right? You already yeah. found it, Petros. Really? I think so. <laughs> Things are we get a better access to our kid here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it was supposed to be done today, but I didn't know that it came already. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Do we have any other questions for Sid? I have one, okay. Sid. Um, how there does, are lots of how things in the chat button, so I'm. Uh, no. No, we look. We look them. Uh, okay. I have a question too, Please. Sid. If I can. Yeah. How does the performance compare to Transformers? Uh, Transformers performs very poorly on, uh, well, first of all, it depends on the problem, right? Because uh, yeah. Transformers performs excellently, for instance, on MNEST, on this problem. But we are comparable yeah. to Transformers because Transformers are also at 98.3, 98.2, 98 98.4. So we're comparable to Transformers. The difference is in the number of parameters. So I think the I think the transformer type architecture, which is uh, the leading one here, is at least a million parameters. So ours is a much smaller one. But uh, transformers they don't work so well on some of these other problems. You know, not everything can be done by transformers. They're excellent at uh, NLP or NLU, but they're not so good at some of these other problems. I don't know if people have tried tried transformers on this particular data set. But I'm sure that, uh, and look at the number of parameters, 1,500. Uh, transformers only take 1,500 parameters per year, right? They will be maybe with a million parameters, you can beat this. But for instance, do you want to put a transformer on a pulse oximeter? Because this is really a pulse oximeter. Right? So this little device, and you want to compute uh, these uh, things here. And do you want to put such big, uh, big systems here? So I think NLP, there's no way you can beat transformers. They just, they beat everything. But on many of these other tasks, uh, I think these architectures that I suggest, they have, like we have also some examples with seismic data sets. They are really, uh, they're good. Yeah. I don't yet have the final results, but they're good. Okay, thank you. In, in the previous slide, Sid, uh, yeah. just got my attention, uh, one before. Yeah. So LS, is that L, the first row is LSTM or RNN? The number it's LSTM. Of so the number of parameters look less than GRU, which is- Yes, uh, this is, I don't know, maybe this is a bad baselining, but uh, the, if you compare with GRU, it's slightly worse. I think you get 92% or something like that. Okay. okay. So GRU is really 94 or 94%. And uh, this is, I think this was the best uh, state of the art GRU for this number of parameters. Maybe if okay. you put a million parameters, you do better. I mean, yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, I see Petros's hand, which is raised. Yeah. Yeah. So first of all, two point. Well, the first point is that Konstantin Rush, who is your co-author on the unicorns, corrected me, and he said that what what we posted it's actually the first paper, as you said, the core. Yes. So the unicorn yes. will come on Monday. So I hope people could contact you and and, and get. Them. I Monday, you can just look at archive and you'll find it. Because yeah, it's, uh, it, yeah. it's... Okay. Well, I will tell them not to contact you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you can contact me at any time. Okay. Uh, so the second question uh, since is uh, with this pin. So I would like to get a second opinion, as we say, <laughs> because I ask my friend George, as you said, and I get an opinion. And now when I get a second opinion on pins, because we tried them also. So, so when you do fluid mechanics and you do mm -hmm. high Reynolds numbers, um, so mm -hmm. you mentioned that the pins may not be so good in, um, in getting shocks and discontinuity. So when you do high Reynolds number fluid mechanics, you have a lot of thin vortex layers, you have instabilities, you have all the activity that's happening near uh, the walls. Uh, and they are very sharp gradients. So is there any hope for pins to capture that stuff? 
Well, George will disagree with me, but I will tell the honest answer. I don't think so. Not in this formulation, because the answer is right here. Yeah, uh, that's my experience. That's my oh, experience. Sorry, where am I? Here. So this is the key estimate. Yeah. Okay. So this estimate tells me that my solution is uh, somehow dominated by the data, right? Or the inputs. Now think of high Reynolds number of fluid dynamics, right? So this is essentially a stability estimate. And it tells me that, okay, the, even if you take a higher Reynolds number, uh, Navier Stokes, even in 2D, you know, forget about 3D, then what I, will happen is that these constants will be very, very nasty. If at all this is true, these constants will be very, very nasty. So it has not, nothing to do with discontinuities per se. It has to do with how badly, or rather I have the reason here. If you measure errors, so first of all, if you have instabilities, at least uh, this theory doesn't work. That doesn't mean that pins don't work, but most likely they don't. Second thing is that uh, discontinuities are fine because uh, maybe I can show you here that we are actually approximating a discontinuity very, very well. There's a discontinuity in the, this hyperbolic equation, not nonlinear hyperbolic, but linear hyperbolic equation. The reason why discontinuities are not captured is because the point-wise residual, okay, when you're really imposing the point-wise residual, that is not going to control the error. And if you don't have that, then there's no chance for that. So a weak version of the residual can do it. And this is what I didn't have time to show. Weak version of the residual can do it, uh, but this is difficult to train because it's more like a gun. You have to use adversarial training. And already with conservation laws, we have some positive answers, but uh, you know, this is very expensive. Why would I use uh, <laughs> an expensive pin to do it, right? When I can, uh, so, to disagree with job for inverse problems, it's different, right? Because then it's a seamless integration between data. And even there, I don't think with 50,000 Reynolds numbers, you can really do it. Okay. You can do it with a hundred or a thousand like he has. And there already you can see the Stokes almost applies, right? Because it's uh, near Stokes. So for Stokes, we have a theory, but for uh, Navier Stokes, this theory is not directly applicable except for very small Reynolds numbers. But by continuation, you can think that this will be okay but not at 10,000 or 50,000. So I don't think, so what he does typically is that he uses data, uh, which is not a data assimilation, but uh, let's imagine that he has a, he has Burgess equation, okay? And on top yeah. of it, he uses some data in the interior. Now this is different because then you have something to constrain your pin, right? So in addition, you know something about the pressure, you know something about the density. It's no longer inverse problem. It's a forward problem with data. Then it's different, right? But then you can argue, why do I need that? Right, means uh, if I'm designing an airfoil for a given no, parameter, I need to know no one is going to give me the data. So inverse problems is it. different, but uh, there is a clear, uh, and it's very, there are many, many, like we are doing a full waveform inversion. And I think yesterday he was doing it in 2D, the student, and. The results are very good, but there these are exactly the problems where the point-wise uh, residual can control the error. For uh, higher Reynolds number fluid mechanics, it, it is not possible. Thank you. Thank you. Great talk. Um, Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much thanks, for everyone. your attention and uh, yeah.